This is Justin Pearson from Def Club and The Locust, and you are listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new scene. I am your host, Keith, and we are back with another brand new episode. And in the guest host chair tonight, I've got Dave Masters from Signal Hill. Dave, welcome to the show. Keith, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Dave, it's great to have you here. You were almost on the show in our first year. We had the whole band Signal Hill on. One of our only full band interviews, but you were unable to make that that recording session, Dave. Do you remember? I do remember. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I, uh, I'm lame. <laughs> <laughs> but we know the, the good news is we have you here now and it's good to have you here. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. Yeah. We've got a top tier episode for you today. We've got Jake Snyder from Minus the Bear. It's a great interview. We cover it all. The history and rise of Minus the Bear. We've got stories from the road. We talk about the final tour. We talk about what Jake's been up to lately. We cover it all. I mean, you've heard it, Dave. Tell the people. It's awesome. Um, You know, I I mean, being a fan of both Sharks Keep Moving and Minus the Bear is fun to sort of like hear, you know, hear him talk about both of those projects and, you know, life on the road and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, super, uh, super fun. And yeah, we were talking earlier, Dave, uh, those bands were influences on you and Signal Hill as well, right? Definitely. I, uh, I can, I just dis- distinctly remember uh, getting Highly Refined Pirates for the first time. And I, I really loved that EP afterwards, um, beer commercials. And yeah. those like, definitely in the early days of Signal Hill, like that, uh, that beer commercials EP and, and Pirates were both ones that I think as a band we all pretty much agreed on at least um brian rishi and i i'm not sure if tim was a huge fan or not but um but i do know that at least the the strings portion (laughs) of signal hill were all pretty down with uh with with uh both of those bands actually yeah i would imagine tim is a fan because i know he was a fan of botch and i feel like if you're a fan of botch you have to be a fan of minus the bear just by association yeah that's probably true (laughs) i i uh i He might have been. I actually just, I don't remember. Um, I know that Rishi and I, um, in particular, nerded out about a lot of that and and a lot of those like shark ski moving um, tracks. Even he'd even sent a song recently, uh, a shark ski moving one that he's like, man, I haven't listened to this in a while and sent it over to all of us. And uh, yeah, so it was timely that you had, uh, you had reached out about this too, because it was, uh, you know, in the air, so to speak. Oh, yes. The synchronicities happen all the time with this show. And, uh, I am happy to make them happen, but um, I remember hearing Highly Refined Pirates for the first time. Perfect album for a perfect age, for a perfect time. You know, early 20s, figuring stuff out, partying. Uh, it just all fit together perfectly, and Dave Knudsen is one of my favorite guitar players. I mean, I can't come close to replicating anything he does, but he was a big influence on me, and I just love the band. I was so happy to have this conversation. And look, we're going to talk more about it later in the show. We don't want to give it all away. But uh, that conversation is coming up shortly. But uh, before we get to that, here's how you can support me, the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Follow one of our three YouTube channels. Subscribe. Turn on notifications. Follow my Twitch channel, The New Scene. We have shirts available at Death Wish Inc. And five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And if you write a nice review on Apple Podcasts, I'll read it on the air. These are all great ways to support the show. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. Drowning Man will be on the Decibel Metal and Beer Fest, which takes place April 14th and 15th at the Fillmore in Philadelphia. It's a great fest. It's a great venue that I myself have been to before. Check it out. Also, there's a new Iodine on Rotation Spotify playlist up. It features a lot of great music, newer stuff, older stuff. Head to Spotify, search Iodine Recordings. You'll see the playlist. Also, don't forget to support this month's sponsor, Bridge Nine Records. You know them, you love them, you want them, you need them. 
American Nightmare, Have Heart, War on Women, Terror, Striking Distance. Everyone who's anyone has been on Bridge Nine Records. Check out their new record store at 282 Rantoul Street in Beverly, Massachusetts. It's open every Wednesday through Sunday starting at 11 a.m. They've got Bridge Nine releases. They've got a whole selection of punk and hardcore releases in the record store. They've got the Bridge Nine Silver Series pressings of some of their most famous records. And you can only get them at the record store. Stop in. You may even see Chris Wren himself. And you can ask him about those pictures of Ben Affleck wearing Bridge Nine shirts. And he'll tell you how the, all that happened. For more information, head to bridge9.com or stop by their Instagram at bridge9. That's bridge N-I-N-E. So Dave... Yes, sir. I have to ask you, what are you listening to lately? Lay it on me. New music, old music, music that doesn't even exist yet. What are you listening to? Hmm. All right. That's a, that's a good question. I um, so, so not commuting into the office, which was a place that I used to listen to a lot of music on the, the, the ride in, um, has really limited uh, <laughs> my music listening and music discovery, I would say. So I find myself going back to a lot of um, records from from the past lately, um, which is probably not too uh, not too different from a lot of other people that sit in this here guest chair. But um, let's see, Tim Hecker um, has probably been my favorite artist for like the last twelve to thirteen years. Um, so I love all of his records. I listen to those a lot. Um, those are constantly in rotation with me. Um, I've been listening uh, a lot to a band called Ida, who has been one of my favorite bands also for a long time and, and uh, big influence to me. And so, so I constantly go back to those records. They feel um, warm and, and, uh, and, and cozy. So, so I like to, uh, to spend time with that. I, um, I've also like, I've been, um, so, so I joined this um, or I started streaming my own music, um, which, you know, maybe we'll talk about later, but the, um, uh, in doing that, I've met a whole lot of um, sort of, ambient artists that, uh, that, that stream a lot of stuff. And so I've been, uh, I've been checking them out and there's so much good music out there. It's insane. <laughs> so I, I try to listen to some of that too. Um, but that's, that's a little bit of my listening. That sounds good. Yes. To our listeners, Dave, in addition to performing in Signal Hill also does like ambient music, uh, that was some of which he performs live on Twitch. Uh, but we're going to talk more about that at the end of the show. So make sure you check back with us then. But I have a music recommendation for the people. The band is Brutus. The song is Victoria. And it's from their latest LP, Unison Life. This song is unbelievably good. This album is unbelievably good. It grabbed me from the very first time I heard it. And I listened to the song like 15 times. It's, uh, yeah, it's like newer shoegaze, but with a bit more of an edge. Check it out. I'm going to put it on the new scene 2023 Spotify playlist, which is live now. Head over to Spotify and search the new scene. You'll see it. I've got all of our guests on there and other stuff that I listen to. And Dave, I hear you about uh, the not commuting to work thing anymore. When COVID happened, the amount of my music I listened to got cut down by like 80%. You know, if I wasn't doing this podcast, honestly, I probably would not be listening to a lot of stuff. So I'm happy that this podcast keeps me in the know. But yeah, no more office, no more commute. And that was when I listened to music the most. Yeah, now I just sit home and watch Twitch and YouTube. All <laughs> <laughs> uh, love that. All right. So listen, check back with me and Dave in segment three. We're going to talk about what Dave is up to. You know, he's streaming on Twitch. He's performing ambient music. He's got Signal Hill as well. We'll talk about how we're doing. But right now, we are going to speak to Jake Snyder of Minus the Bear. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Jake Snyder. Jake, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Jake, it's wonderful to have you here. You know, you've had quite an illustrious career in music. You've been off the road for a little bit now. I'm curious about everything, and we're going to cover all of that. But Jake, first, I want to ask you, how are you doing today? Today, I'm doing pretty good. Thank you for asking. I'm 
the uh, the day has been relatively mellow. The sun was out. Um, it was chilly. My kids have Spirit Week this week, so they both dressed up like today was 80s or no, it was um, like historical, dress up as a historical time period. And so ah. my daughter was 80s and my son went as 2023. <laughs> nice. So you have a son and a daughter. Yes. How old? Uh, my daughter is eight. My son is 11. Ah, so they're probably happy to have you home more now, right? Or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, it's been four years. What year is it? 23. So four years since our last show. Um, and they're, uh, so yeah, they're a good chunk of their lives has, uh, they've had dad home. So that's cool. That's a good thing. So Jake, do you realize you were playing and touring in Minus the Bear for like 18 years? Yeah, 17, 18 years. That's wild. It is wild. Yes. Yeah. Growing up with the band. Yeah. Like what? how old were you? Let's say like first EP when things are getting started. Um, so that would have been 2021, um, 26, 27, I think 25, 26, 27, something like that. Somewhere around there. Yeah. So yeah, like, so th- these are like the formative years mm-hmm. that you spent touring and playing with the band. Yep. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, where you're like, how am I going to be? You're an adult, but you're like, how am I going to be an adult? <laughs> I mean, uh, you must have done pretty well because the band did incredibly well. We continued making great music right up until the very end. Like me, I I started to become a mess when I was 24, and then I just became a bigger mess until I was 35, and then I kind of figured it all out. But it doesn't sound like that was your story. I don't know if I figured it out yet at all. Um, yeah, the being on the road f- through that period of time uh, lets you kind of be, well, you don't have to grow up necessarily. You don't yeah. have to do a lot of the kind of things that a lot of people in their 20s and 30s have to do. Um, so I don't know. Sometimes it felt a bit stunted almost in a way, but, um, now in reflection, looking back at it, but, um, starting to get things figured out. That's good. That's good. (laughs) When you, uh, during the height of the band, you know, when things are really picking up through to the end, were you just doing the band? Like, did you have to work other odd jobs and other things to make ends meet? No, no. We stopped working other jobs probably in just a few years into the into the project, so 2005 or something like that, around the Meneseloso era. Ah, okay, okay. So it must have been a big change for you in 2018 once uh, the band is all wrapped up and you're entering a new life, or was it? How was it for you? Well, it's, it's that's a it's an interesting question. You you'd think it would be a big change, but it's a, it's kind of an it was an easy segue because when we come home from tour. Um, we come home and kind of have that same experience until the next batch of writing or the next tour comes up where you come home and it's kind of over for a while and you get to get some space from everybody that you have just seen for 24 hours a day, six, you know, for six weeks or whatever. And um, yeah, so coming home from that last tour, it was kind of similar, you know, you're, you're home, you're with your family you're decompressing. It was just, I think this, the last time, just a bigger release. And, you know, the, the party had at the end of the last show, the feeling had a bit of a, well, it was just more final, right? So you had this bigger, it was more love in the room kind of thing. And, you know, we luckily had three shows in Seattle for our last hurrah there and so each night was kind of that way until you know the final night it was just like okay well this is it and uh that was that and then you come home and and it's like being off tour again and you kind of slowly ease into knowing you don't have to go to the next thing were you happy were you sad like what what are your feelings during that initial easing into the the real end of the band are you like oh my god we're not gonna get together to write the next record or plan the next tour or whatever else. I was relieved. It was, um, a lot of that stuff was kind of, uh, was always painful 
for me. You know, I wrote uh, most of the lyrics um, and that was always difficult. I was very critical of myself and um, it uh, and going on tour toward the end with children and whatnot was um, anxiety inducing. So being able to know that we, that I wasn't going to have to do that again. I wasn't going to have to, um, you know, have my family be without me for, you know, months at a time, weeks at a time, um, felt pretty good. That makes sense. Cause I imagine you're in your forties mm-hmm. by the time the band is done, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I just turned 40 this year and the thought of going out on a tour is the least appealing thing I can think of right now. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's, it's been four years now and, um, it's, it seems more appealing than it did a while ago. Um, yeah. now these days and, you know, especially with going through a worldwide pandemic situation and, um, the isolation of that. And I mean, I, I'm sure you, you've noticed a lot of bands have reunited and taken advantage of this kind of return to normal scene, the live music scene. Um, and like bands that, you know, I grew up with, it's like, yeah, I mentioned to a friend of mine earlier today, I was like, it would be nice if some of these bands would, you know, leave some stage time for some of the younger kids these days. You know, uh, the story of how Minus the Bear ended is not typical. I feel like most bands just burn out and then it's done one day. But you and the rest of the band had the opportunity. You announced the end of the band and then we had a farewell tour and far- farewell shows, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's got to be good because instead of things just like coming to a sudden end and maybe people are angry at each other or maybe there's some beef, like you can have a real goodbye. You can enjoy every last show of the tour. You know, if you're in the mood to enjoy it, maybe there's an off night, of course. You can and take in every moment of those last shows in Seattle. You can be with your friends and family and have like a real good send off and a real good end to things. Yes. Yeah. That was the best part of the experience was having it be a um, kind of cathartic, really kind of a, like a family feel to the whole last tour. Um, we were all doing pretty good. We had a um, our relationships were really good with each other. And we had a, an amazing crew on that tour. Um, and our, the drummer we were playing with was like, is Josh, um, sparks. He was, he's one of the nicest people in the world. One of the best drummers that I've ever played with and having him around really helps elevate any room he's in. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, I felt we're playing better than we'd ever played before. Um, having a better time than we'd ever had before and going out with um, kind of in the way that we wanted to like choosing to do this in a certain, in a certain fashion and rather than um, yeah, some like we're lucky. We're lucky to not have those kind of conflicts. I mean, we'd had them in the past, the, you know, some pretty big um, personal issues, but we kind of pushed through all that with in the professional world of things. And um, so it was nice to be able to be set like somewhat settled and be like able to um, yeah, make a decision and, and do it while we were kind of on the top of things rather than heading down the hill toward the bottom. Exactly. And that's what you want to do. Like uh, Jerry Seinfeld always talks about the end of Seinfeld and he was like, no, I'm ending at the top. So we don't just like peter out and people get tired of the show. It's like a comedian's set. There's a perfect amount where it's like you leave them wanting more and they're happy. And if you go over that, then they're like sick of you. But mm-hmm. I think you did it the right way. And look, not most bands can't choose that because there's so many unexpected things. There's a big fight or there's some controversy or I don't know. I've been in bands where you just it's just over one day. That's it. Every and no one really says anything, and you don't know what's going on. But you, you know, you, this is the best case scenario here with minus the bear. Yeah, it was ideal. So, when did the band decide it was going to be over? Like, what was going on? How did you know? I f- personally felt like I didn't. 
I just was kind of done with it. I didn't want to make another record. Um, like I had, like I said, a lot of anxiety about traveling, leaving the family or, or what, and whatnot. I wasn't in the best mindset when this, you know, when I'd made my decision, um, you know, don't make decisions when you're you know, not settled, but whatever. Um, it was, and, and also it was like, okay, so if I like, what else are we going to do? Are we going to wait until things kind of decline or we have an opportunity to kind of do it now and, um, see what else the world has to offer each of us. And yeah, I mean, I don't know if, you know, I, I don't know how, the rest of the guys felt when I kind of approached the band and was like, I'm, I can't really continue with this project too much longer. Um, and, uh, cause it was like, you know, our livelihood. So yeah. when, um, but I think, I don't know, everybody seemed to come around to the idea that this was what, you know, the trajectory was. So you break the news to the rest of the band. When does this happen? How does this happen? Um, God, I don't even really remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, um, and the other guys might hear this and be like, that moron, it's not what happened. <laughs> um, That's okay. It's, it's the best to your recollection. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, uh, around the voids period of time, um, around that area of the band's history, um, 20, 17 ish. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I wish I, it, I wish it was a better story. Like I could have, you know, taken them all out to a, a nice dinner and been like, you know what, baby, this is it. <laughs> that's what, that's what I'm curious about. Cause I'm like, you know, these messages have to be delivered like at the right time in the right way I've learned. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering like, do you just drop it on the table and everyone's like, ha ha, what? Or is it like, you know, I guess it just happened one way or another. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was expected. And I'm not sure if I expected everybody to be like, what the fuck, you know, or um, <laughs> or if I expected them to be like, ah, oh, finally somebody said it or whatever. But, <laughs> um, but yeah. So once you're off the road, mm-hmm. what adjustments do you have to make? I mean, you're out there playing clubs to rabid fans and having a good time i'm sure i mean did, did you have to come home and like learn a new skill or get a new job or make some kind of adjustments at home what did you do i took a, a, a long time to hang out um spend time with the family figure out you know am i gonna be yeah am i gonna be a stay-at-home dad full-time or uh, or what um i'm really into hi-fi um so, you know, stereos, turntables, really nice speakers. So there's a, a an amazing hi-fi shop in Gig Harbor that's just across the Narrows Bridge from where I live. And um, that's where I started to go when I moved to Tacoma. I started to go there to check out gear and buy gear. And I just started talking to the owner quite a bit and becoming friends and, um, I just said I should probably work here if I'm going to hang out too much more. So, <laughs> um, get paid for it. Um, so I've been doing that kind of moonlighting over there a couple of times a week for the past, I don't know, four, four years or so. So pretty much since, um, things slowed down. I mean, I was, I actually started working there before the last tour. So I kind of had this little kind of fun gig going on, but, uh, I never really, you know, I, I, I'd had thoughts about like, oh, maybe I'll open a hi-fi shop someday. I, I should probably work in one if that's my idea and see how it, how it works. And now I've kind of discovered that that's not necessary. I can just kind of let him own the hi-fi shop, my boss. But um, yeah, it's, and then, you know, the kids have kind of grown up and grown more independent as thing, as time has gone on. So it's not, not quite as necessary for me to be like as stay at home. Um, but I haven't really delved back into music or, or too much in the creative sense of things. I'm more kind of interested in how music sounds on the other side coming out of speakers these days. Yeah, I was curious if you had like started a new band or are still playing. I'm, I'm 
I uh, admire people who can do that. Like one band will end and then they'll jump right back into a new one and they, that, that creative fire is always burning. I don't think I'm like that. If this podcast ended tomorrow, I don't think I'd ever want to look at another podcast again, or at least like <laughs> for 10 years or something. I'd want to be away from it for a long time and I'd want to do something completely different. Yeah. I mean, for me, I had no real interest in, I thought I would do it at some point and, you know, I noodle around a guitar or whatever, but, um, I did join or, um, Eric Ockrey, a friend of mine that he's a, a drummer. Like when I was a kid, I was like, he was one of my favorite drummers, um, is in this band tree people goodness. He played some, uh, percussion on, um, some built to spill stuff. Um, but he, he was in this band Christ on a crutch with, uh, Nate Mandel from Sunny Day and Foo Fighters. And so it's kind of like this, you know, institution, Northwest institution. And um, he, I met him during the recording of um, Voids and he played a little, I don't know, shells and some percussion on that, a couple of songs. And we discovered we both live in Tacoma. So I started, we started hanging out and another guy, another local Tacoman, um, Justin Tomega, he and I were friends and, so we all got together and started jamming um, with one of Eric's friends, Nate, on bass. And it ended up being called Jen, J-E-N-N, just our, wait, what was it? J-J-E-N, just our first names, initials. And we recorded, I don't know, six songs, just truly kind of jammed some stuff in the studio for, like, Eric was running time and he wanted to kind of just see what happened and we put it out just kind of put it out on a uh, band camp i guess or tune core however tune core distributes music and um that was ba- 2019 2019 and i think it's really good i think it's really cool um it kind of imploded like just personal conflicts within the band uh-huh. um and it was really not ever what I would call a band more of just like a project and yeah, but that's pretty much the main, the biggest uh, commitment that I'd had post band the, um, but yeah, I totally like it. If anybody wants to check it out, J J E N, you know, Um, I got to check that out. And, and you know, my band, my, the band I'm putting together now, we cannot, agree on a name no matter what happens so i'm like thinking of the first letter of all of our names now Mm -hmm. and i'm like will that work Mm -hmm. could it work so i i don't know we'll see if you have like consonants and vowels you might be able to work it out everybody i'm gonna see if everybody's first name is if it's all k's i wouldn't do it (laughs) yeah it's a three piece too we'd be in big trouble (laughs) (laughs) but um but yeah it was all instrumental stuff um and it was a lot of fun in the studio. I have to check this out. I'm a big fan of instrumental music, post rock, some ambient stuff, you name it. Good stuff. What are you into right now? What wh- of that? Do you ever listen to Hammock? Mm-mm. No? No. They are they are my absolute favorite band. They do it all. Straight ambient, straight instrumental, more post rock stuff, more traditional band stuff. They're extremely versatile and I absolutely love them. Sounds um, like spelled like it sounds. Yeah, just like Hammock, like The Thing You Lay In. The Thing You Lay In. Yeah, they have a million albums and they're all good. Uh, My favorite is uh, Everything and Nothing. Okay. You have to check it out. I'm writing it. You hear the clicking? I'm I'm typing it into my computer. Yeah, I could tell you were. I'm glad because that, that, you know, it's going to change your life. Um, uh Uh-oh, that's scary. We'll see. We'll (laughs) see how it goes. Um, Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I'm into for the most part these days is that kind of uh, instrumental electronic. Um, and if it electronic, I mean, some vocal electronic stuff, um, and j- almost 90% with women singers, but yeah, like Nils Fram and, um, burial or this group desolate, check out them. Their, uh, record exceptionalism is awesome. Um, man, everything, everything for a band. that's like a, you know, drums and bass and guitar and sometimes keyboards. That band is probably my favorite group in the last decade. 
Oh, good. I uh, whenever when I edit the show, I listen to all the recommendations and bands people mention. So I'm excited to dig into this. I uh, I haven't kept up on post rock lately because I'm so busy with this show. I'm pretty much just listening to like whoever the next guest is. Sure. Um, but I love the classics. You know, Mogwai, Caspian, mm. um, all that stuff. And then uh, Hammock is like releasing a new album soon, so I've been listening to that. So. Yeah, I I I love that kind of stuff. I would love to be in a band like that one day, but mm-hmm. uh, we'll see. We'll see what's in store. Yeah, so would I. I mean, having that, um, I you know, playing playing. So would I again. I mean, Sharks Keep Moving had some of those instrumental tunes back in the yeah. day, um, and that stuff is is uh, is fun to do. Saying something without words is a is a difficult, but worthwhile project it really is i get annoyed when people listen to post rock and they're like oh where are the lyrics and i'm like no man like you don't need the lyrics Mm -hmm. like you you can build a whole story around a song just with the feeling and the music you just you just don't need it yeah don't be impatient listen to it a couple times (laughs) yeah like explosions in the sky your hand and mine you're telling me you need lyrics for that yeah no no lyrics would ruin that yeah I mean, lyrics ruin some bands anyway. Yeah. Do you ever uh, do you ever hear lyrics in a song? Like, this happens to me sometimes. I, I hear a really good song and I'm like, fuck, yes, this is awesome. And I think it's going to be instrumental. And then I hear lyric, I hear someone start singing and I'm like, nope, I turn it off. Do you ever do that? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah there's, yeah, there's just certain vocal styles or whatever that I'm averse to. You know, the music might be cool, but if somebody shits on it with bad <laughs> bad vocals it's 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 difficult i mean you know i mean maybe my voice is an acquired taste as well but um that's yeah it's it's funny i wouldn't say you know as an outsider i wouldn't say your voice is an acquired taste because i think your voice is it's like pretty easily digestible you have nice lyrics they're nice and relaxed the voice is relaxed it's not like this shrieking crazy thing or something that you have to get used to it's just like ah okay it's like a nice brandy nice i like that that's that's, yeah that's a great compliment i mean a lot of the stuff that like even everything everything that band i was speaking of earlier they have uh the singer has just a really unique voice and it i can see how like i'm really attracted to that that's his style and like the style of the band or whatever but um i think that that might be a more challenging sound i mean even when i first heard the band karate i was like huh his voice and then karate turned out to be like one of the most influential bands to me or like chavez and you know matt sweeney's voice on that is like but i could see how people would be like off put off by it but it's like for me i'm just like this is this is the shit i like that i was gonna ask i was gonna ask like who inspired you take us back a bit you're in State Route 522. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, Sharks keep moving after that. What's your thing? Like, what music grabbed you? What bands are you seeing? Who are you trying to replicate? Um, With State Route 522, we were, I was trying to do something like more uh, anti perfectionist in a way. Like, our drummer played bass, first drummer played bass in, uh, in, my previous band um and the bass player was my uh, was my girlfriend at the time who never really played much bass so you know it was kind of raw and trying to at, at the beginning trying to figure out kind of how to write songs with while people are learning how to play music and one of the influences then that like kind of pulled me was um link Northwest band with Sam Jane was the songwriter singer. And it was just this kind of like really honest and earnest, very stripped down aesthetic. So like that kind of stuff, some, a lot of the Pacific Northwest kind of somewhat quirky music. I can't even really think of a hell of a lot. I mean, back then, and and we were also kind of a lot in, there was a lot of influence from, um, the like sec uh, San Diego scene, um, like uh, Angel Hair or the VSS or like um, 
some more screamy kind of proto screamo bands that we took on some of that, but not apparent in the end result. I don't think too much. Yeah. Um, I was still like, you know, loved super chunk and a bunch of the kind of Midwest fire hose and that kind of music and, and at that time. And, you know, just kind of kept going and got into the like tortoise and Juno 44 and, um, a lot of that touch and go drag city, um, that realm that and karate and that, that kind of, um, non West coast stuff. I would, I would say, yeah, there's, there's, it's, you know, it's just too much to really put it all in. Like there was too many influences. I wonder if that was one of the problems back then, but, um, I think it, I think it worked out and you know what? I say this all the time. I think having a wide range of influences will only help you as a songwriter. Because when I was a kid and I wanted to be in a band, I would be like, I like X band. I want to sound like X band, period, done. And you're going to limit yourself that way. And now I pull from crazy places and end up writing, you know, more interesting stuff. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, we were, it was all the Seattle stuff at the time too. You've, you know, your Nirvana and uh, Soundgarden, Mudhoney, and all that kind of stuff, as well as the more underground, like Behead the Prophet, No Lord Shall Live, and um, Unwound, and um, Built a Spill, and Tree People. And um, then I was also listening to Slayer, Metallica, and <laughs> hardcore bands, Northwest hardcore bands like Undertow, and um, just all kinds of, you, you know, you you get something from everything. And I mean, you know, it could be even, you know, a painting or a poem or something. You obviously like are constantly influenced and you're a filter for all this stuff. Around when sharks keep moving is performing, moving into minus the bear. How old are you at the time? So that's 99, 2000, 2000. So I mean, 25, like at the end of sharks, beginning of minus the bear. So where are you at? at that time are you thinking you want to do music full time like do you have any sort of plan as far as life goes like where are you at i knew that in in sharks that that wasn't probably in the cards so i didn't consider it too much i just kind of thought we would keep playing and see what happened i mean i think at the end sharks was a pretty awesome band um it was me and Nate Turpin, uh, one of my closest friends at the time, um, Jason Clark, who was in, who ended up playing with um, Pretty Girls Make Graves. He was in Kill Sadie, and Morgan Henderson, who's now in Fleet Foxes. Um, and you know, it was a really cool collection of people playing. And uh, but it was a transitional, like transitional period, like where I had like a real job and. You know, I was married, I think, 20. No, I was almost married. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, who knows? And, um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, when I heard like the guys, I was friends with all the guys in Minus the Bear. Um, and I heard that they were kind of, uh, that Aaron and, and Dave and Corey and Matt were, uh, playing together and they played me their little, their demo tape. And I was like, yes, this is great. Who's going to sing? And they were like, oh, Dave or Corey or, you know, I was like, what if, hear me out. What if I sang (laughs) for the band? And like, uh, I mean, you know, it started as kind of a side project to everything because everybody had like, you know, their bands, Botch and Kill Sadie and Sharks. And um, so at that time, I didn't consider it until we'd finished the first EP and like, we would, we were like, we set the band up kind of from the beginning to have the potential. We were like, okay, let's make an agreement. Let's get a booking agent. Let's, you know, try to make it as give ourselves a foundation so that if we do want to give it a go, we can. So you did that. Yeah. And then it was like, how quickly can we make this happen? I feel like Pretty quickly it happened. I caught wind of the band after the release of Highly Refined Pirates, like many others, and 
I mean, I, things happened pretty quickly after that album came out, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like everybody liked the band right away, and the, you were off to the races. Yeah, the we were lucky enough to have um, Suicide Squeeze kind of from the very beginning. Like, f- from, I believe, before I joined the band, he was interested in, he was friends with Aaron, interested in um, putting out a seven-inch record for the project that they'd had going. and. I, so he put out gigantic before, like that was done basically before we played a show. So we already had a label. We did the, some, a little bit of touring on that, did pirates and put a lot of effort into touring on that and getting the, you know, the best support slots we could. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it had a pretty good response. I mean, it wasn't like overwhelming and it wasn't, you know, we still had a few years of really kind of slugging it out in small rooms and um, certain cities with two people in the audience that weren't us uh, or the other bands and um, sleeping in the van sometimes or sleeping in uh, everybody, five people in a hotel room. Yeah. Mo- motel room. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to lie about it. It was a motel. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it took a long time to get it to the point where it was like a comfortable situation. So yeah, I remember seeing you early on. I, th- I think I saw you at the church in Philly, mm-hmm. um, Unitarian Church. And then not too long after that, I saw you at the truck in Philly. Mm-hmm. And then you were gone, like you were off to bigger things. Uh, some sometime not too long after that, when when uh, in the life of the band did things like really start to take off? Where where you're like, oh, okay, we're getting more comfortable now. I think uh, Menace Aloso, when that was happening, it was that was kind of it. So we, I, th- God, my timeline memory is about as bad as it's probably a condition. How bad my. <laughs> aligning time frames is but yeah i mean philly in a lot of ways was a launching point for our for our band so like we had our first um like touring sold out show in philly what's that bar that the small bar the 21 and over place in what year are we talking we're talking this is pretty early probably 2003 4 5 something like that let's see would it have been uh pontiac grill kyber Oh yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that place. Yeah. Yeah. It was like you had to take out part of the stage to load it into it's it was a an interesting venue. <laughs> um so yeah, and then and then yeah, the TLA and um yeah, being able to kind of progress from the the church to um yeah, it was interesting playing we'd played the church for we played there for a while and then did the one Kyber show, which was a little bit like this is interesting. Um, and then uh, up to the TLA, which was, we were like, this is a, cl- this is like a legit, a legit club. Yeah. So kind of around that Oso time, we were, I think that's kind of, that's, you know, when everything became, you know, when it became a full time all the time band we were you know when we were home we were practicing uh every day of the week weekdays like as if it were a job and and kind of writing and and treating it pretty seriously and you know we got to tour with some amazing bands at that point like opening for braid opening for cursive played a few shows with um pinback and yeah it was it was you know starting to get some festival traction and yeah it was cool was that the most fun time for you in the band? I don't know. I don't I think that it it got more fun as time went on. So, it was always hard, but it got once it got a little easier, once we got into like a easier traveling arrangements, like a bandwagon or a bus, that kind of thing and not having to worry about hotels um have, being able to um you know, the venues in general had green rooms. We didn't have to stay in our van to, to be out of the venue. Um, just getting, you know, getting more money 
that kind of, and, and, you know, like you, you're getting to the point where we were able to cons- concentrate on playing the show rather than like survival mode constantly. That's when things got more fun. I mean, you kind of look back and you're like, Oh, it was fun when I slept under the van, but was it all things kind of shine up in, you know, reflection. That's something that you look back on now and it's like, Oh, that was fun. But when it's going on, it's not that fun. Yeah, you don't remember how hot it is and like that there's like a cricket next to your head it's, or like, you know, sleeping on a floor and in a kitchen and looking under the stove and being like, Jesus Christ, what is happening to me right now? Did you ever like stay at someone's house and it was just a real horror show? I remember <laughs> yeah. staying at I remember staying at someone's house. I I can't even say on the air what was going on in there, but mm-hmm. it was like it's just like so disgusting. Yeah, we yeah, the whole like, hey, we need a place to stay. And then some fan is like, Yeah, come with me. Um, and you get to this, you know, it's inevitably forty five minutes away from the venue. Yeah. And then you're just inundated with like I love these people, by the way. I'm not I'm not yeah. trying to talk shit. But like, you know, questions, questions, questions. And um and then you sleep on a on a couch that smells like cat pee. If you're the lucky one. <laughs> and somebody always has to sleep in the van to protect it from the from the from theft. <laughs> Good times. Good times. I uh um during that time we're talking Mensos and after that it, I mean are you still are people still buying records are we are we are we still like it's not like the deep trenches of the internet and social media yet like are you, are we still selling records like how how do we know we're doing well? We were selling like CDs compact yeah. discs um you know getting play on the college music radio like cmj was a thing so you could look at the charts and see where your songs were going yeah it was a it was it was very different like we always had vinyl but yeah we sold a ton of cds back then on the road and uh i mean that was you know a huge we're talking like this is the period of time where you printed out your map quest directions to the show. Yeah. So like it wasn't, there was no streaming at the beginning. There was like, I'm sure it was starting up in some, you know, infantile form, but it was, it was just physical media, which was pretty great. And even as things progressed into it quickly, you know, quickly became, um, Na- you know, Napster, LimeWire and all that stuff emerged quickly after we began. And even that we kind of saw as a alternative to being on the radio or something. We were like, it didn't really bother us because we were like, okay, they're going to, if somebody can spread it around this way, word of mouth and hear it for free, they're maybe going to come to the show and buy a t-shirt. Um, but yeah, I mean, back then it was definitely like compact discs and CDs and we sold lighters and shot glasses and anything to get a couple bucks. I first heard of Spotify in 2011, I think. And I, I the idea of streaming was like, I was like, ew, no, like I want to own it. So, mm-hmm. you know, if we were up late listening to music, this was when you could just Google like minus the bear media fire and, and get like any record that you want at all. It was like those file sharing, mm-hmm. those, those file upload sites were running rampant. So... When when did you see things shift and did you have to make like any adjustments or did you have a big enough fan base where it's just like, no, we just continue touring and selling merch? Yeah, it didn't really, we pushed through it. Like it didn't change anything. On the road, the merch sales continued to climb. I mean, the, the rooms got bigger and the merch, it just kind of CDs stopped being part of it. They just went away and it was all vinyl which is great. I mean, it's, it's heavy. So you have to have a shit ton of boxes of vinyl, but like, um, but it's, uh, I thought that was really cool that you could have the, the vinyl was always the consistent seller from the beginning of the band to, Oh really? Yeah. To the, to the end. So yeah, that was pretty cool. Like we, you know, I was into it, The you know, I was heavy into vinyl and, just as a reproduction method. So I, I was pretty focused on getting as good a quality product as we could. So yeah, I love that we would always 
have that available for people. Yeah, I you know, I didn't even know records and vinyl were a thing until I got into hardcore and then like you could only buy stuff on 7 inch and and then I'm like bothering my dad dragging his turntable out of the attic and I'm like we have to get this thing working and he's like why what the hell are you doing like mm-hmm. I miss that though because uh now you can find everything on Spotify and YouTube but you get into a new band and then like it's like, oh, okay, I have the CDs, but it's like, oh, they have these random seven inch, split seven inches out there. And mm. then you like track those down on eBay. And it's like this, this hidden gold that you find a new song that you haven't heard before. And then you got to get the turntable to play it. It was like, I don't know, it was uh, more rewarding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have a thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, an item. It's really weird to not have that anymore. Yeah, I I do probably at home i do probably oh god 80 percent streaming and 20 yeah. percent vinyl there was a period of time like when the band was going on and i thought and streaming tr- quality truly was fucking garbage just not in my opinion listenable or like even itunes purchases at that point in time uh album purchases i did it to hear the music but i still thought it sounded awful and so yeah, like my home system was all like there was only vinyl for a long not to brag <laughs> or be a snob <laughs> about it, but like that was kind of my focus. So and you know, still even like from the you know early mid two thousand or early mid nineties, still have like a you know, racks of seven inches from all these very temporary bands, um, and some that have continued on but yeah it's 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 cool to have that and back then it was a a long a a starting point you know like i put out this state route 522 seven inches and sharks seven inches and things like that and it was like the cheapest way to get music to people and you'd charge three dollars for them you know and uh it's and you'd press it like a thousand of them, like a psychopath, because that was like the <laughs> the point at which it just made sense that you could actually sell it for a little bit of a profit if you sold all of them. But uh, but you'd end up with. I still have boxes of sharks seven inches that I should probably try to sell. Yeah, slide a couple of those on eBay. People will buy them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do that. I'll <laughs> make a fortune <laughs> on the side selling my old band's shit. <laughs> It's been in an attic for 20 years. What do you think? You want it? Well, 25, to be honest. It's uh, searching for sugar man syndrome now. Like sharks keep moving, has been fermenting long enough. You've been inactive. Now you could uh, get some of those reunion dollars. What do you think, Jake? Yeah. You know, if if shark ferments long enough, it just starts tasting like the worst possible cheese. (laughs) I've been to Iceland and they have the fermented shark there. It's pretty gnarly. Wait, you've had fermented shark? No, I haven't had it, but they have it there. I, oh, I've been I was going to say. I think Corey is the adventurous eater, and he had the. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't enjoy it. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound good. How do you feel about cassettes? I'm annoyed by them. Like I know that there's trends with uh, different formats, and that cassettes are the cheapest right now. And you know, I guess they're the new seven inches. But I'm irritated as a whole by cassettes. Always. Your thoughts, Jake. Uh, the worst possible music format. <laughs> like, thank you. I we've done them. You know, it's always kind of a novelty thing. Um, yeah. Do you? Yeah. Do you drive a 1998 Civic? Like, do you have a cassette deck anywhere? Like, do people <laughs> have these things? In the hi-fi world, we do have some cassette decks for sale that are like vintage Nakamichi or Tanberg or something like that, and like we do sell them and people have collections um, and these are kind of high end pieces, but in general, even then I'm like, come on, it's, it's, <laughs> there's literally no good thing about the format. It's always sucked. Yeah. And like you should sell them with a small pencil so that you can tighten up the wind on them <laughs> for every cassette. But yeah, it's come to be some kind of tchotchke, not necessarily yeah. like a playable it could be blank. Most people wouldn't know. Exactly. It's like a it's like a souvenir. It's a souvenir. Like I mean, the greatest thing about cassettes was you would get one, and if you didn't like it, you could tape over the little hole <laughs> and dub 
you know, make a mixtape with it or something like that. No, it's the worst. It's the worst in terms of sound quality uh, reproduction until they came up with MP3s until high res streaming became a thing. Well, I'm glad you agree. Yes, it's not my favorite format. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it too much more or else I'm going to get mad. <laughs> We're going to move on. Mm-hmm. 17 years of touring and minus the bear. How do you do it? I mean, I would lose my mind. Like, did you ever have to overcome some adversity? How did you keep yourself centered? Pull back the curtain for us a bit. Yeah, I mean, they're keeping myself centered is not my, never really my strong suit. Um, back then, uh, I mean, we drank a lot, so we smoked a lot yeah. of weed. Um, I don't smoke weed anymore. Kind of makes me loopy, but um, yeah. But yeah, we we imbibed, we partied a lot. We had we try kind of tried to squeeze as much fun out of the opportunity as we could. Um, I never got into any kind of like on tour or even at home zenny kind of stuff to you know, I center myself or whatever. I guess the closest thing to that would be like getting as stoned as seemingly possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, being out there with the bands that you're touring with, like that was the whole thing. Like m- there, I, there's nothing that beats those kind of friendships that are transitory, but like become this really intense closeness and yeah. you don't talk you might not talk to them for 10 years but when you see them like you had experiences together that no one else can really relate to yeah and when we toured around like let's say like boston for instance we had like a lot of great friends like um the people from 27 who we took we took them to europe and um the cave guys and um we just had a crew of people and like that would come out to all of our shows and hang out backstage and whatnot. And we had some people like the 27 and cave people, obviously they maybe not obviously, but they were like lifelong friends and, you know, really close friends, but we would have these groups of people that kind of came together and became friends in our backstage room. And like every time we would come to town, they would all have this little reunion with us, our reunion with them, these friend friends would see each other again and then they would probably never see each other until we came back together. Oftentimes they would become friends in quote unquote real life, but like, yeah, you'd have this, this kind of this after years, it just becomes like this reunion thing. Like you're in a town like LA and you have people that come from different places and different peoples in the band's life, but, but they've seen each other, you know, once every six months for the past four or five years. Yeah, I miss stuff like that. Like, uh, I never developed any kind of adult skills until, I don't know, the last couple of years. So I drank a lot and I did a lot of drugs and that's that's just all I did. And, I, you know, you're talking about like those transitory relationships. I do miss stuff like that. Like, oh, we see these friends because these people are here at a bar and we go here and we meet the dealer and we're out all night till 4 a.m. And it's like, uh, I I do miss that stuff, but I can't do it anymore or I will die. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. (laughs) I could probably do it though. I think I could do it. But yeah, like, I mean, I, you know, the, some of the people that we tour with are going to be like, no, you don't. But, um, I try to come out and see the bands that we've toured with when I can, I don't live in Seattle anymore. So it makes it very difficult to, uh, to get there. And, and like, you know, Seattle's usually for a lot of the, for a lot of the bands for, or for a lot of bands, isn't a Friday, Saturday stop. You know, it could be a Tuesday stop or whatever. Um, and it's just, it, it, you know, with, being a 46 year old dad with two kids and wanting to be in bed at 10. I mean, that's even like luxuriously late, um, is makes it difficult, but like, you know, I'll try, I'll go up there and try to be part of that reunion when I can still. So you don't smoke weed anymore? No, it's been, a, it's been quite a few years. 
Yeah, maybe, I don't know, five. Oh, wow. So you were just able to put it down and stop just like that. Yeah. Yeah. See, it was. I admire that. It was not easy. I'm, I'm one ah. of those people that, that, that kind of gives a side eye to the idea that it's non-addictive. Um, <laughs> it, it was, I'm, I'm, I mean, I would do that with cigarettes too, though. Like I would not smoke at home, but I'd smoke on tour. Yeah. So sometimes I can be that on off kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the last time I stopped, I was like, it was a difficult transition, but it was easy to stop. The aftermath was not easy to deal with. Um, but then it got better. What was the aftermath? Sleep stuff and that kind of thing? Just like anxiety, no appetite, um, moodiness. Yeah. Like normal, like things that you would consider, you know, things you would consider normal with like quitting a, a thing, a narcotic, or like even quitting a, I mean, everything is somewhat, you know, probably quitting gambling would give you some of the same results. It really would. Like any addiction you have, there's going to be like a physical and mental adjustment period any addiction even gambling yeah so i mean it's a it was probably one of the one of the best changes i've made in my life um and holy shit i've saved so much money yeah you know when i uh when i quit drugs i i got like this sober app and it, i tra it tracks like your daily spend and i think i was spending like i don't know 40 grand a year on <laughs> things <laughs> The, the what we do for fun dude dude <laughs> i had one of those for smoking and i was just like holy god what <laughs> and i smoked american spirits like some kind of psychopath yeah though i i did too they just never end it's crazy the yellow pack is the one i would have and i, I had a thing like you said you would only smoke on tour i had the thing i i would say i would be like i only smoke when i drink but i'm constantly drunk <laughs> <laughs> sounds about right yeah so I uh, cigarettes I could always pick up and put down somehow, but uh, uh, other things weren't as easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, and that's kind of the the one of kind of one of the mainstays of of touring is, um, obviously these substances and the uh, availability and it's on the rider and you know you roll into a town and you're like, we need. An ounce of weed. We need. You, know, you could. X. You could do it. You could do that. Oh yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Like on the rider, would you have like weed on the rider? No, but we would. It was. Yeah. You. You can call you, it. In you, there was people who could get things done. People can get things done on the road. Yeah. Nice. Anything spicier? Could you be like, look, I need some Molly and some Coke and some K. Do you? Do you have a guy? <laughs> and then they would like run and get it. Could you do? Could you pull that shit? No, not really. Oh. That wasn't necessarily our bag. We were, yeah. we were like, we were like a bunch of hippies rolling around playing math rock. That's honestly, that's the way to go because, like, once you get into the the other shit, everything falls apart. I mean, you know, I'm no angel when it comes to things like that, but um, yeah, it was never something that that was like a, a never was like that was a treat. You know, that was like, yeah, you know, beef stroganoff. <laughs> Can't eat it every day. Exactly. Exactly. Brooklyn Vegan recently ranked all of your records. What do you think when you see something like that? I think it's awesome. Like there's people still actually like thinking about it. And and it was, you know, I think related to the 20th anniversary of Pirates coming out. Um, and it creates like a bunch of, you know, amongst the fans, a bunch of controversy because nobody ever agrees. Yeah. Um, it's almost like there's an orthodoxy of the what you're supposed to like in the minus the bear catalog in what order in a way. But like I don't agree with it. And, you know, the band never knows what they're supposed to think about their own music ultimately. But um Yeah. The great thing was that piece was called like worst, you know, minus the bears albums, worst to best or whatever. And yeah, well, like, you know, that's what they said, worst to best. We've yeah. got Infinity Overhead at, at number eight, and then Pirates at number one. Like, do you look at that and you're like, oh, well, who are you to 
call my albums best to worst. I'd, I'd probably get like, I'd probably get a little offended. Well, and then they had, you know, the, a lot of comments about that kind of thing where they, people were like, there is, there is no worst record, which is nice. Yeah. I'm like, thank you. Um, but if you read even the infinity overhead blurb about it, it was incredibly kind. And it was, you know, the, whatever the, quote unquote worst one was the writer really liked that record still. So I guess you have to pick a worst if that's like the angle for the article. You have to p- pick a worst. Yeah. And uh it's nice that it's not like holy shit this is a bad record. Why did they <laughs> why did the studio not shut this down? <laughs> um but yeah, I mean and that's the thing like, you know, I don't I think Infinity is one of my favorite records um i put out like my each band member a while ago put out their ranking of the records and uh mine was wildly different than everybody else's but what's top of the list for yours i would i think it's Oso. and how come it was just that's where we gelled it's where it kind of came together and like the recording was awesome and had a pretty cool story over overall not it wasn't in any way a concept record but like it seemed like a cohesive piece of music or album yeah um that's that's one thing i really like about your lyrics is they just paint a really good picture and story without being too like you know like with some singer songwriters it's like literally a story like johnny came home from the war and then he met mary and but yours is it just kind of paints like this broad stroke picture of like nice things and i like that about it yeah i mean that's always been kind of the intention was to kind of focus on a vibe or like a moment and give it to people and uh you know with the band in general i think like you're talking about with this write-up of infinity overhead like didn't seem like there were many controversies with the discography with fans i mean it seemed like everybody was pretty happy with everything and the band had big reach like I was in hardcore La La Land, so like, I kind of discovered it because I was heavy into botch, and oh, Dave's in this band now, let me check it out. So everything was always kind of tied to the scene with me back in the day. Not now, not anymore, but Minus the Bear had reach. Like, there was people who didn't know anything about the scene or care anything about it who really liked the band. Plenty of them. Yeah, it was cool. Like, it was, I mean, it was, it's cool to have some level of crossover ability through these different genres of music. Um, It's difficult sometimes when people don't know how to categorize you. So there's not a super easy box to throw you in. So that can have its challenges for a career, but like, yeah, it's great. You have somebody that's like, yeah, I love hardcore and like botch opened me up to you guys. And, um, or like, yeah, I saw you guys play with incubus and I, I loved it or whatever. Like, you know, there's, or I saw you on Daryl Hall's house, live from Daryl's house. And we, you know, after we, er, after Alex and I did live from Daryl's house, we'd start getting these people in their fifties and sixties coming out to the shows. Wow. Uh, So yeah, every little entry point, you know, you you never know where people are going to come from. Yeah. You know, it's actually good that you couldn't be, easily defined because you avoided like all the you didn't get sucked into like any of those trends over the year like emo like i think you avoided that whole thing Mm -hmm. and uh whatever else was going on i don't know throughout the years yeah very consciously avoiding offers to play um what's that one oh um uh the vans tour what is that (laughs) called (laughs) that's the warp tour warp tour yeah uh so you made conscious efforts to avoid some of that stuff yeah, I mean, you know, you curate the offers you get sometimes just to stay out of the, <laughs> you know, the idea of that. It's like, you know, I'm, I love Pennywise. I love Bad Religion and um, all like the epitaph, you know, and all that stuff. It turned into kind of more of a um, eyeliner situation. But uh, yeah, I, I we just didn't want to be associated with there were things that we were just like, no, I'm not going to do that. Or like if something was being sponsored by a, a company we didn't like, we were like, no, I'm not fucking dealing with that. So smart, smart yeah. decision-making. You never know. 
could be limiting, could be smart. You never know. I'm looking at like the track listing of Infinity Overhead, and yeah, there's a couple I couple songs I'd toss off of here, but man, there's there's a few, <laughs> there's a few f- bangers on this one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Look, the album is what it is. You get together, you have a certain amount of time, uh, whatever's going on feeds into it, and that's it. Yeah. Five and a half stars on al- from Alternative Press for that record. Five and a half stars out of what? Five. Or four and Wait. a half stars. Four and a half stars. I don't oh, know. I was going to say, if they give you an extra half star. They should. <laughs> they should. <laughs> <laughs> not, too, not too shabby. Thanks, AP. What's going on with that? What's going on with that magazine these days? Did Pitchfork like minus the bear? I, I, you know, I know they're pretty hard on people. I mean, con- yeah, considering it was, you know, how hard they are on people, I was pretty happy with a lot of the reviews we got there. That's good. Yeah. So what do you have coming up? Anything, any new bands or any new uh, adventures or anything that we want the people to hear about? Um, I did. Yeah, I did one song with Dave, Dave Knutson from the band on his solo record. Um I did a song with um, Jonah, one line drawing on on that record, just playing guitar, um, and it was. And I don't really have any anything planned, you know. My friend Rocky Votolato invited me to play solo opening for him in Tacoma a couple weeks, few weeks ago, and I was like, no, <laughs> I don't have any. But flattering, you know. So like it the idea is always kind of lingering in the back of my mind that, that, that I should do something at some point. Yeah. I could see you as like a acoustic singer songwriter type, you know? Sure. I mean, most likely my record will just be like bleeps and bloops and like, you know, birds tweeting and kind of ambient noise and nobody will like it. And that would be, make me very happy. <laughs> Do you, uh, what do you do? Do you record in Ableton and do you mess around with all that stuff? When I do, I'm using Logic, just kind of Apple default um, software. I would, I would prefer Pro Tools just because I know how to edit in that more from back in the day when that was, but now it's on a subscription model and I'm not going to fuck around with all that. So, um, uh, I just, I still don't really know how to make my way through um, logic in any, you know, I, I haven't learned the software, but I can demo in there and I can, you know, that's where I recorded with Dave and with Jonah and um, got them the material. So yeah, logic and some, you know, universal audio Apollo from, I don't know, 15 years ago, whenever they first started that thing. Some, that's what you're hearing right now is me through the uh, Apollo twin from Universal Audio from freaking 20, oh, probably 2010. Oh, well, it sounds great. Thanks. Yeah. I'm using a nice uh, tube mic. Oh. <laughs> Gives it that um, that tone that you want. I just upgraded to the Shure Podcaster Special, the SM something, and I got an XLR input now. It's crazy what's going on over here. Man, I, shoot me a photo. I want to see it. I want to see I, I'm up. going to. You you check your email. I it's crazy. I've got two uh, desktop gaming PCs connected. I've got three keyboards in front of me. I've got two mics. It's uh, I I learned all this stuff. We start. I used to have a co-host, so I, that's why I say we we started the podcast right before the pandemic. Pandemic hit, and then I was like, wait, we're stuck inside. Let's take this thing weekly. Yeah. And then uh and then I just figured out all this stuff. It was like it was like a very happy accident and now this is like all I do, but it, I love it. It's fun. That's great. Yeah. No cool. I'm going to send you a I'm going to send you a picture of the setup. You'll like <laughs> it. it uh, just ignore the, the all the ugly cords hanging in the background though. Oh man, you got a a little cord uh, hygiene helps. Yeah, I've been watching YouTube videos. I'm going to do it eventually. I just when you know, there's no time. Never is. Yeah, the, the I, I admire you, podcaster guys. Like I've thought about, like how would you do that? How do you come up with these ideas and questions every week and find the people to do it and 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 make it a, a and a you know a, a sticky thing for people to come back to? That's pretty cool. It's it's hard, but uh, I I listened to Howard Stern for like thirty 
plus years. So there, there, I drew some inspiration from there. I have specific things I always like to know from people. And I'm associated with uh, iodine now. So that really helps too. Very cool. Yeah. Well, Jake, this was an amazing conversation. And I want to say thank you for all the music you've given the world. You know, I've been listening to you for a very long time. And thank you for taking the time to come on the show. This was really awesome. Well, thanks for thinking of me. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate that. And there you have it. Jake Snyder. Wow. You know, that was a really good conversation. Like, I'll tell you, Dave, whenever I go to sleep at night after I do the interview and I dream about the conversation, I know that it was a good conversation. And that happened with Jake. He was just such a relaxed, very nice person to talk to. I thought he had a very soothing voice, you know, and it was just great to hear about one of my favorite bands, like we were talking about in the beginning of the show, foundational band for me. I'll never forget hearing highly refined pirates for the first time. Yeah, just a, it was just a foundational record for me. And just hearing, hearing everything from Jake's perspective, from the band to their rise. And I, I thought it was interesting how he said, like, they purposefully made some decisions to keep themselves out of like certain musical trends. Like when he said, uh, they purposefully never played Warp Tour. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> but they really stood on their own in like terms of sound. Nobody sounds quite like them. They had a great career. And they ended the band on their own terms. You know, there, there's no big controversies that I can think of. There was no sudden end and, and we didn't hear from them anymore. They had a final tour. They had a final record. They got to say goodbye to everybody. And it sounds like Jake is doing great now. And I, th I thought it was interesting. He didn't just like jump into another band. You know, he said if he was going to do something, it would be more like ethereal, like something like you're doing now, Dave. And uh, he's in no rush to launch back into it. So he was just a really nice person. And I'm glad I had that conversation with him. Yeah, he seemed he seemed super cool and, and super down to earth. I, I, um, I, I mean, I know you've seen them a few times in, in Philly based on um, the conversation, but I had seen them on the Highly Refined Pirates tour in LA. I forget if they played with Piebald there, um, but I had just moved to Los Angeles from Phoenix and I saw them there. It was at, um, God, what is that place in Hollywood? Um, Troubadour, Troubadour Glass House. It was at the Troubadour. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was at the Troubadour and, um, and it was mind-blowingly good. But then I saw them a year later in Phoenix at this really small venue called Modified Arts, which was really great DIY art space venue. And, you know, that fit like, I don't know, one to 200 people max. Um, so it was really small and dude, they killed it. And um, just seeing Dave on those Line 6 DL4 pedals, like yeah. that was like, that was, that pedal was really sort of pretty pivotal for me when I first started playing guitar. Um, cause I, I played in bass in bands, but then I really wanted to play guitar and I moved to LA by myself and didn't know anyone. And so I sat in my room, uh, playing guitar. And so, so I had really gravitated towards learning how to use that pedal for looping and stuff. And then when I saw him like taking it to like a whole other world with like four of them going at once, I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> this guy, <laughs> how does this guy have doing all this with two feet and, and riffing at the same time. So, um, super fun band, uh, and, and, you know, definitely lots of memories with them. And so it was cool to, to hear the conversation with, uh, with Jake and uh, a lot about them and seeing that he seems like a pretty good guy. So that was, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Just a, just a great package overall with that band. Dave is unbelievable on guitar. I have one of those DL4 pedals now and I've, I've done a tiny bit of looping, just messing around, but the thought of f using four at once is like, is just scaring me. <laughs> I can barely loop with one of them at, you know, at all. So, uh, yeah, just him and, uh, you know, Jake's, uh, wordsmithing and ju it just the way he tells a story in a song. It was like capturing youth at the perfect time and a really great band. I, I, I just listened to them all over again after that conversation and, you know, it was just remembering a lot of stuff from the past and just really great band. Totally. Yep. So thank you, Jake. Thank you, Jake. That 
was awesome. So, Dave, let's talk about our favorite subject, us. How <laughs> are we doing? And you know what? People hear enough from me, so I want to start with you, Dave. Let's talk about where Dave. Are you based in New York City? I'm outside of New York City. We uh, we bought a house um, out in Long Island um, shortly after we had a, a kid. We were living in Brooklyn for a long time, and then um, where in Brooklyn? Um, we were in like the Park Slope area. We're in a neighborhood called Windsor Terrace. Oh, I am familiar. Yes, yeah. So we were uh, we were there, um, and uh, it was awesome. And we miss it, uh, but we had a we had a toddler uh, at the time, and he was making lots of noise, and it was it was really stress inducing for us because um, the place we lived in we had a a landlord who lived above us and uh, neighbors below us in a row home, and every noise that was was made you could hear it through the whole house, and um, it was really stressful. <laughs> Did they complain a lot? Yes, and <laughs> then the landlord complained, and then we just said. What are we going to do? And uh, yeah, we ended up stumbling upon. I, I mean, in hindsight, at all, we we made a pretty um, pretty rushed decision to move. But um, you know, it's been good. We we have a, a space here. Um, it, you know, I think post COVID, you know, having like the uh, enough space for like an office and everyone to be here and stuff has been really has been really pretty helpful. So having a, a small yard and stuff, which has been pretty good. But we are away from friends and away from our our people which uh which always makes it hard. Yeah. Like I I I sometimes entertain the idea of moving out of Brooklyn, but I can't imagine it at this point because I've been here for 10 years, so most of my friends and everything that I do on a daily basis is here now. It would be very difficult. Yeah, we make it back there a lot. We we go we have we still have friends in our old neighborhood and um favorite places to go visit and stuff. So we go back quite a bit. Couldn't you have just told the landlord and the neighbor to like get over it? You know, because that, <laughs> that's kind of the way it goes in New York City. Like if you have rugs down, like if you do all the things you're supposed to do, like it's kind of that, that you just have to deal with it. Yeah. You know, and, and being a parent, you go through a fog of where you're not sleeping very well and you're just very like, um, I don't know that the extra anxiety was, was, I don't know. It was really getting to me. I don't know why, uh, in hindsight, it was like, it was such a short period, like in the grand scheme of things, it was, it was probably, a, a, a decision that if we could go back and kind of change some things, we probably would have, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not all bad, uh, either, here either. So, yeah. And whenever stuff like that happens, like I automatically think, I'm doing something wrong. Yes. And I just I just want to fix it right away. Like I don't think like, wait, is this my problem? Do I need to fix it right now? Uh did I actually do something wrong? Like I'm just like, okay, sorry, like, you know. Totally. Yep. That's yeah. that's ha- that's exactly how I-, I probably overreacted um to try to, to or overcorrect, I should say. Um, yeah. Yeah, cuz it was but it was it was causing a lot of it was causing a lot of uh angst in me for some reason. I don't know why. No, it, it would have caused that for me too. Like I've been on the opposite end of that where I'm somewhere uh, underneath somebody making a lot of noise. And well, I, you know, I didn't really, I didn't do anything about it really. I just kind of dealt with it because I, I was afraid if I said something, it would create an awkward situation like what you, with what you went through. So it, I just dealt with it, but I guess that's part of living in this city. Yeah, uh, that's, I mean, and that's, I, that is kind of it, right? Everyone sort of on top of each other. <laughs> You're going to deal with noise living in New York City, period. Big time. So Dave, in addition to your work in Signal Hill, you are now streaming on Twitch. And I love that because I'm on Twitch 24 hours a day, <laughs> uh, not streaming so much. I, I really don't have a whole lot of time to stream. I tend to do that when I have a day off or a week off or something like that, the holidays, you know, that type of thing. But you are on there and you are performing ambient soundscapes. Talk about this. When did it start? How did it come together? How did you start doing it? Yeah. So, so, so Signal Hill, uh, just as a band, we are located all over, (laughs) all over the place. So Brian. Yeah. UK, California, New York, right? Yeah, and, and Brian's up in Oregon. So now, so getting together is really difficult. And right, right at the start of COVID, like literally, we had a tour booked. It was going to be our first shows in like four years. Um, oh, I remember that. I I was going to go. Yeah, I forgot. That's one of the m- many shows in March that I was going to attend that got canceled. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So we um, 
so we, <laughs> I still have all the merch here for, cause we basically bought a whole bunch of merch, uh, had it shipped here cause the first show was in New York and, uh, we were, we were going to play and, um, it was going to be our first time getting together and COVID hit and literally canceled the full tour. Um, so that, that was a bummer. Um, and since then, like, well, directly after that, me and Rishi started working on new songs and we'd already been working on some new songs sort of across the pond. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard doing that as a band. Uh, like the, the, there is no instant gratification other than like sort of writing a part, but then you're sending it and you're waiting for everyone else to listen to it, get some ideas down. So, so that kind of, that, that process just takes time and it is, I am patient and I am willing to, and we are still doing it and, I still enjoy doing it a lot, but um, I started just trying to experiment myself because I was here and I was like, music is such an important part of my life. And um, so I just started playing a little bit more um, at home by myself and, um, and spontaneously, like I was having a chat with Rishi one day and I've gotten this, this effect pedal and um, this is a very long answer, by the way, but, um, <laughs> Oh no, we want this. It's, Please it's, continue. It's going somewhere. I swear. Um, and so, so I decided to put out like this little release, um, after a couple months of being isolated, um, that, you know, in hindsight is, um, pretty terrible, but, <laughs> but it was, uh, there was something like spontaneous and, um, it sort of captured the moment for me. And it was very different than anything that we had done with Signal Hill. Like Signal Hills, you know, we, we would practice a lot. We would really demo a lot of, of before we'd go to, to make a record and then you'd stew on mixing and finishing that thing for, for forever. And then you focus on the artwork and the whole thing. And the process is just really long. And so, um, so, so I was like, I wonder if I could do something that's a little bit more immediate. It doesn't take as much. Um, sort of effort. And I'm not going to overthink it too much. And so I started just kind of like um, putting out a couple of releases that I just did on sort of Bandcamp and then had a good friend who um, who runs a record label called Better Looking Records, which has put out some of my favorite bands. And so uh, he's like, hey, you want to, let's try this as an experiment for, for you and for me on the, the label. And let's just see if we can, um, you know, let's put it out. And so we put out one of, one of the releases on that. And um, so I just, had started kind of doing this, like making my own music. I had never thought to do it um, before that. And um, well, at least as Signal Hill was going at least. Um, and so, so that, that sort of happened. Um, and then I had a good friend who plays in a uh, band called the Little Spiking. He also plays in Rishi's um, other band, Sky is All Right. He plays the drums. Oh, is that Chris? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, Metal Chris. Yeah. And so he plays in a, um, he has his own solo project called Belted Sweater, which is fantastic. Yes. A year ago, he had asked me about playing a show with him in Brooklyn at, um, I remember if it was at Gold Sounds or one of those places. And um, I had never thought about playing my show uh, or playing a show by myself. And yeah. so when he had asked me, I thought about it and I was like, there's no way I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, so then I was like, you know what, maybe what if I just try to replicate that at home? Um, and so I will just basically stream my practices at home. Like it's playing a live gig. And so the whole point of me starting to stream on tri Twitch was, can I make 25 or 30 minutes of improv impro improvised music that, um, if Chris were to ask me again, I would feel like Chris or anybody uh, that I would feel like I could get up there and play 25 minutes without embarrassing myself. <laughs> so that I started doing it on Twitch and then started connecting with, uh, with some other people who were doing similar stuff. And uh, yeah. And I, you know, I try to do it whenever I can, but it's, it's effectively like it's my practice sessions. So I just, I'll just um, after the kiddo goes to bed and I'm like, you know what? I got a little energy left in me. Let me, let me go turn this on for 30 minutes and just go play and see what sounds come out. Um, and so that is, that is how it started. And then a year later, um, just this past December, Chris had asked me again, cause he was coming back. He said, it's my annual ask if you want to do it. And, uh, I took him up on it this time and gave it a go. So, <laughs> uh, so it paid off all the practice paid off. It, it worked. I played a show. So that was, uh, that's my long winded answer of how Twitch started and, uh, and my own sort of solo making music. How did the show go? It was good. It was, um, it was super fun. Like 
Chris is such a sweet guy. And, um, you know, I was, was just thrilled that he had asked me, um, and got to see some friends who I hadn't seen in a while. Um, I haven't, haven't been to any, really any live music since COVID being out here is kind of hard to get to shows. It's like, you know, like Jake was talking about where the, we're the 45 minutes away from the venue, uh, family. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm old now. And so, <laughs> so the <laughs> thought of doing that and like, you know, getting home at like one 30 in the morning from, from a show at St. Vitus feels, uh, feels painful to me. At this yeah. Moment. Forget it. I, I barely go to shows anymore. I just, I can't do it. I can't stand up for three hours. I don't want drunk people bumping into me. I just, I just, it's very rare occurrence now. Yeah. And so, so that was, so, so it was, it was really fun. Like just seeing some friends who I hadn't got to see in a while. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, uh, my, my kiddo who's, who just turned seven. He, uh, is really, he, he was, he's so sweet. He, he thought like me playing at a show, um, meant that there was going to be a lot of people there. And so he's like, how many people were there? And I was like, I don't know, like 15, he's like 15,000. And I was like, well, <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not quite that many. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. But it was, yeah, it was, it was, it felt good. And I would, you know, I'm at this point now where I feel like I could do it again. I felt like I learned from that show, um, which is very different than doing it in your bedroom on Twitch. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, so it was fun. Yeah. You know, it, it's gotta be great too. Like you have this thing, it's yours, you're performing, you call the shots, you write and you perform it by yourself. Like you don't have to rely on other people. And that, that was part of my beef with, uh, being in bands before, like I'd be in a band, I'd invest all this time and the band would always end, uh, usually sometimes because of me, but not always because of me. And I'd be like, God, now, like, I never thought to myself, like, hey, you can do something yourself. Like until this podcast came along, I never thought like, hey, like you can make your own thing. You can do your own thing, like whatever it is. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's one of those things where I, I really don't overthink it. Um, like I, I had done this. So, so in addition to the Twitch thing, I had sort of like, I had tried to commit to, to putting out more music too. And so I, I put out a new release every band camp Friday last year. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not going to keep doing that this year, but like, you know, it was, it was such a fun project. I started it, uh, in, in January for the first one. And like the way the whole thing came together is, I would just record one of the sessions from Twitch and then, you know, cut off the start and the end, which are always a little rough on those and, um, you know, rip the audio. The artwork is effectively like me and my seven-year-old, <laughs> we paint pictures and then I just take a photo of it, drop the name on it and literally upload it to Bandcamp. So, so like I could, I got to the point where I could record the music have the artwork done and uploaded to Bandcamp like within 30 minutes. And like, again, it wasn't overthinking it. Some of those releases, I, I mean, I'm, I like all, all the music is like, you know, stuff that I still feel good about today. But like, um, it was, you know, just an exercise in trying to sort of build this muscle of saying, you know what, not everything has to be perfect and precise and, um, you can still continue to sort of like release stuff and continue to do stuff and, and have fun with it and not worry so much about it. Like I'm not, you know, um, if you look at the band camp play counts, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, it's not flying off the shelves and I don't care about any of that. It's, um, it's, it's some point, like if somebody stumbles upon it and really likes it, that's cool. And if nobody did, Hey, that's also okay. Um, it's it's still me doing what I like to do, which is creating things and and putting it out there. That's great. That's the same approach I take with this show. You know, I do it every single week. So while I do obsess about things and try to make it perfect, I also keep in mind it's every week. Like you have you do this every week, so I have to get them out the door. And um, on the other hand, I'm putting together a band. Uh, I've been working on it since just before COVID, and. So we've basically been working on these four songs for two years. So it's like it's like the juxtaposition of those two things, which I imagine you have with Signal Hill too. Like when you listen to Signal Hill, some post rock can be meandering or experimental, but Signal Hill is very precise. There's repeating parts. It's almost like verse, chorus, verse, bridge. If if like you imagine vocals over it, it sounds like a lot of work goes into that. So it's nice to have that. 
And then you have your own thing where you can just do your thing and put it out there. Totally. Yeah. That, uh, and um, that, that's, that's exactly how I feel. Like we, we have, we have enough material for a new Signal Hill song. Like me and Rishi have written like guitar parts for I think eight or nine songs. We probably have more than that um, in, in sort of like some sort of demo or rough shape. But like we got enough that if we got serious about it, we could probably uh, crack crack out an album. Um, and nice, yeah, which is great. But you know, it's it's also hard. Like uh, Rishi just had a baby. Um, well, Rishi's wife, not Rishi himself, but, uh, um, and then Brian also just had an, another kid, um, and, you know, just being spread out all over the place. It's, it's hard to kind of make that time, but like we will eventually, and we will do it cause, um, we still all have fun making the music together and, um, there are three of my favorite people on the planet. And so, um, you know, we've, we'd always kind of said we'd keep doing it while it's fun and, uh, you know, and we'll prioritize it however we can, and whenever we can. And that is been a very low pressure band for its entirety. And, um, you know, and so, so we'll keep doing it for as long as, uh, as, as long as it makes sense. And uh, as long as we have some energy that we can put towards it. And I- I'm really excited about the new songs. Um, I think that there's some really, really cool stuff in there. And, um, you know, I'm hopeful that we can, we can get to it sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, like, you know, Rishi will still send a new idea every once in a while. I'm a little more terrible about sending new ideas, but um, wrote a couple of new par- uh, new songs uh, at the start of the pandemic in particular because um, we were getting ready to, for that tour. And so I, <laughs> I'd been uh, thinking about all the tunings for Signal Hill and been playing kind of Signal Hill style music. And But then since then, it's like, all right, well, now I'm kind of doing this other thing for a bit and there's no real rush. So and we got enough. We like, yeah. Uh, ho- hopefully, hopefully, you all will get to hear it at some point because I think the songs are really good, and um, you know, we like we like to make them good. I'm looking forward to more. I like everything you guys have done. I've been a fan since the very first time I heard you. I th- what was a song I heard from? Uh, I think it was the first EP. The first song I heard was Los Federales from the self titled EP. My friend put it on a mix cd for me back in like i don't know 2007 2008 oh wow. and i've been a fan ever since that's awesome yeah that's always crazy too I, I never knew how like how people would would hear or get those records too like you know we were i mean we played a lot of shows in the la area because that's where we were all living when we were like the most active but like yeah it was um yeah it was, it was such as just like a a labor of love that we just hey we play some shows made a record, plays more shows, make another record. Rishi moves to Europe. Okay, he comes home. Let's make another EP. <laughs> uh, and so, so you know, we just kind of got into that rhythm. We weren't really, we, weren't tr- we had no other kind of like grand ambition. There was no, like, we all knew that, like, we just liked making music and we just wanted to, to put it out. If, if we liked it, we thought other people might like it. And that was really the, the kind of... <laughs> the extent of it. So, so it's always wild to hear how people heard it. It's like, wow, how did, <laughs> how did you get that CD? Uh, my co-host was uh, the person who put it, my old co-host of this show, Tommy, was the one who put it on a mix CD for me. And we have a mutual friend who is a big post rock head, as, as well as I am too. Like I used to like comb blogs and lists for bands and all this stuff. So I, I was like on everything. I don't do that anymore because I don't have the time, but Listen, whenever a new band comes across my desk and I hear it and I like it, that's always good. But yeah, Signal Hill has been a favorite of mine for a long time, and I'm looking forward to a new record when, let's say when it happens. We'll be optimistic here. I was going to say when and if it ever happens, but that sounds too ominous. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. We, we were we were just texting the other day, too, because... Um, there was like some some uh, travel that was occurring, and it's like, oh, if a couple of you are going to be together for uh, an extended period of time. Maybe you can book some studio time and work on these tracks. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if it happens. We we have recorded. Um, we've been a band apart from each other longer than we've been a band together, which um, feels really weird. We were super active for like the first five years, sort of like two thousand four to like two thousand nine, and then. Rishi moved away and then he moved back or he was going to move back. Um, and I moved to New York and then Rishi ended up moving to New York. And so 
he and I, during that period, we got to write so much stuff together. It was like great. He lived around the corner from me. We were playing a lot. Um, super fun. And, um, like that was when we wrote the chase the ghost record. And yeah, so, so like, but, but we haven't lived in the same city in since 2009. So that feels, so we've, we've gotten a, a process down being a, a band that's kind of spread out all over the place, but now it's a little harder with just more responsibilities and it's harder to just kind of say, Hey, we're going to spend a, a week in New York kind of re- recording. Cause I have a, I have a kid, um, two of the other guys have kids. And so doing that is a little tougher these days. Um, so we're, we're just slower about stuff now. <laughs> right. Uh, well, you know what? It'll be worth the wait. I can wait and I'm sure everybody else can too. And uh, let's see, in terms of what's going on with me, nothing really. Um, New Year's is off to a great start. I'm back to work now, which I hate. Uh, I would like to not work. I'm still trying to figure out a way to do that and still make as much money as I do. Haven't figured it out yet, but I will soon enough. And my goal for this year is to play a live show with my band. We don't have a name yet. We almost have enough songs for a set. I'm working on a new song and I really like it. That's about all I've got, Dave. What's your band like? Um, imagine like Ink and Dagger and Sonic Youth, like going back into an alley to buy drugs. <laughs> that uh, I have a picture in my head. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like DC slash hardcore slash screamo slash space rock. Sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah, I really like what what we're doing. Uh, more will be revealed. Uh, I, and that's my goal this year, play a show. My, I was shooting for first quarter of 2023. That might be too aggressive, but I don't know. We'll see. Shit, if we have four songs, I'll go play some and open some show. I don't care. Because uh, the I made the mistake I made with my last band. I tried to do it too professional. We got the band. We wrote a set. We went into a studio. We did like a track by track recording. So by the time the record was recorded, the band broke up. <laughs> You know, so and, and then the, you know, never got to play a show. Uh, EP just kind of went by the wayside. So I'm doing the opposite this time. As soon as we have like 15, 20 minutes of material, I'm going out and playing a show. I don't care. I think that's I think that's the best uh, the best way to do it. Yeah, just get out there and do it because you know, I, I was like, oh, everything has to be perfect. I'm too self conscious. Blah blah blah. I don't care. Like, I can go out there and be a mess and still be better than a lot of bands. I know that. So that's what I'm going to do. I mean, if you get 15 to 20 minutes of, of songs that sound good, like... Yes. That, I mean, that's... Yeah. I mean, And we're pretty damn close. See? There you go. That's, it's going to happen. I would I would book the date and, uh, and make it happen. Oh, that's a great idea. If we booked the show, that would make us finish the... Okay. I'm, I'm going to take this back to the boys and we'll see what happens. But Dave... Listen, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show. You know, I missed you back in 2020 when we almost had you on, but you're here now, and it sounds like you're doing a lot of awesome stuff. Tell the people where we can find you on Twitch, Instagram, wherever your music is. Yeah, so um, Keith, thanks for having me. Uh, Super good to be here and uh, finally getting to connect with you. Um, Yeah, so so I can be found on uh, Instagram, Twitch. Um, and I'm just, just trying to explore a little bit with like YouTube, just kind of uploading some of the videos up there too. But um, Dave Masters Music um, is the handle for all of them. And then of course, um, Signal Hill. Um, so just search Signal Hill Band, not the one in Nova Scotia, uh, <laughs> Halifax, Canada. That is a different Signal Hill, um, though they play a lot of cover songs. Um, so if you're into that sort of thing, you can maybe check out that Signal Hill too. So that is a different one than us. Um, Imagine if the Nova Scotia Signal Hill covered you, Signal Hill. It would be fantastic. We have gotten a lot of requests to play weddings in Nova Scotia, and we promptly have to tell them that we think they're talking about the other band. <laughs> so, <laughs> What if you just showed up and played one of the weddings? Um, <laughs> you know what? That would be amazing. <laughs> Give it some thought. Can Give it some play, thought. I think. Can you guys play Sweet Caroline? No, <laughs> but we'll play Los Federales because that's Keith's favorite signal hill song. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thank you, Dave. And look, I'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And until next time. <laughs>